great tuner. It's lovely to see everyone here this evening. We've obviously got a great speaker and topic in store for us this evening. So my name is Sasha and I'm the geologist stroke educator for the Waitaki Whitestone Geopark. Um, and uh, this evening we're very lucky to have Kieran from uh, Totara Estate come to speak with us. Um, as you know, uh, the Geopark uh, covers a wide range of topics, so everything relating back to the earth, but we have those rich stories on top of that, and one of those is some of the social history of the area, which is very important and something very relatable to a lot of us. So, great to have Kieran along. I first met Kieran on a um, Waitaki Tourism Association bus tour that I was comparing on, um, and learn all about New Zealand lamb and its export from Totara State and I've been telling everyone about it ever since because it was a really exciting story. So uh, wonderful that we could have you here tonight and to learn some of the social uh, stories that you're going to tell us. Now I just noticed that the um, title is a social history from Otatara. Now we all know Otatara as um, the... Ototara. Oh, sorry, Ototara. Sorry, yeah. Otatara is the official name of the Omaru limestone that we've got here. Yeah. So um, cool. that's what it's labelled on our geological maps. Yeah. So it has a rich geological attachment as well. Yeah. Yeah. So welcome Kieran. Thank you. And over to you. We will um, have a period of time for questions at the, at the end. Thank you. Oh, kia ora everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, ko Kieran Mackay, tēnei. Um, I work for Heritage New Zealand, Pohere Tonga, and um, I'm the property lead for those that don't know, for, and I look after Tortora Estate and Clark's Mill. I've opted to read tonight so that I don't leave anything out or get distracted, so I'm, I'm going to keep doing that, and hopefully I can also um, use my little PowerPoint as well at the same time. So thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. When Lisa first asked me, I was a bit unsure about what I possibly had to say about the geopark, especially in light of the previous lineup of speakers who all seem to be scientists with important things to say about the geology and ecology of the Waitaki region. Lisa reminded me that the ge geopark concept itself includes cultural and social aspects, which is all about the people who make up and have made up the history to this point. So I always like a good people story and I'm sure you all do as well. So, we're very fortunate in Waitaki to have not just one, but two significant Heritage New Zealand Pohiri Tonga properties, Totara Estate and Clark's Mill, both remnants of the mighty 15,000 acre estate with its heyday in the late 19th century. Both of them could be considered important visitor sites. Whoops, what, 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 what have I done? You just <laughs> looked the wrong way. <laughs> Stop it. It's cool technology. I hope I haven't, oh, I think I might put on a timer. Oops. Can I pause it? Is there a pause button? Um, don't know. Space bar. I want to keep it on that one. Oh, there's a, is that a <laughs> Yeah, no, there's the next exciting, so now, you've, now you've got a glimpse of the next exciting slide. <laughs> All right, so, um, both of them, as I say, could be considered important, part, uh, important visitor sites in the geopark. For a start, both are built from the beautiful local Omaru limestone and both produced high quality food made possible, possible by the happy combination of limestone and volcanic soils in the area, the foundation of geogastronomy, if you like. The Clarks of Clarks Mill also went on to become very good examples of the 20th century of rural enterprise and created many businesses from the mill site, one of them being exporting limestone all around the country into various parts of the world. Now let's try this. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Got it? Yes. Anybody know what that is? Yes. How many of you knew there was a little bit of our geopark in Auckland? <laughs> the Auckland Town Hall is constructed of stone from the Clarks Brothers Enterprises at Mahino. <laughs> Just going back to, back to excellent food, National Lamb Day, which is sponsored by Beef and Lamb New Zealand, is on May the 24th. And that day has been chosen as such because it was the, the, the day the first shipment of frozen mutton landed safely in London 
right back in 1882. So on Monday, 149 years since that occurred. And on Sunday, we have our version of, of National Lamb Day. Uh, it also happened to be Queen Victoria's birthday. And although we like to think that she may have had roast mutton for tea that night, it may have taken a little bit longer than that particular day. So that's a small advert there for um, National Lamb Day on Monday, uh, on Sunday, I beg your pardon. Lots of things happening there, so do come along if you get the chance. And that's our little shout out to the Geopark from us at Heritage New Zealand. I haven't finished yet, thank you. I've been, um, I'm, I hope there's not going to be too much heckling tonight. Uh, you're probably wondering where the heck Ōtōtōra is. This is the poor, miserable specimen of a tota tree the area is named after. Mm. Walter Mantell, when he travelled through in 1848, described an area of land just south of Omaru as Ōtōtōra, meaning the place of Tōtōra. He was referring to this solitary tota tree growing precariously on a prominent limestone outcrop. In a comparatively dry landscape of tussock cabbage trees in Madagari, this tree stood out as a landmark for many years. This limestone outcrop was part of that broad band of limestone that runs from Kakanui up to Otakaiki and defines so much of the landscape of the region I'm focusing on tonight. And as you all well know, limestone outcrops often mean limestone caves. And beneath this tree, there was a cave that seemed to be pretty well used. So I first encountered this cave when I started working as a guide at Totra State right back in about 2011. As a recent import from the North Island, as they say down in these ear parts, <laughs> I really had to brush up on my South Island history. I know I'll never be a local, but consider myself pretty much an Otago girl now and very passionate about the area. I actually came from rural northwest Auckland and moved down here when I married a good southern man. I fell in love not only with him, but Omaru as well, via the Victorian Heritage Festival and the Fate. As far as being a Jaffa goes, and I get teased about it often as by one of my colleagues, I have to say in my defence that I come from good southern roots. My father was born near Invercargill and my mother was born at Seacliff, where her father was a doctor at the time. Anyway, I have a degree in history and English, so I had somewhere to start from, but I tended to make more sense of Northern New Zealand histories and European history rather than Southern New Zealand. Ask me, ask me about Europe from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Battle of Waterloo. So I set about learning the story we tell our visitors when they arrive by way of introduction. And because my job was to guide people around the site, I obviously had to take my cue from the interpretation on site in the museum and learn the stories to be told there. So I just took a photo of that board. These interpretation boards this date back to the opening days of the 1980s. So the story was really <coughs> focused on the new, mainly British settlers of the pastoral kind. So it backgrounds the way our farming history played out in terms of run, estate, farm. And then of course, the main focus was on the frozen meat story, which was fair enough. This is where we would normally start the story if you were visiting the estate today. So you can see here a little bit about Charles Susted, a Swedish sailor who took up the original depasteurizing license to runs 12 and 13. There's also a picture of Robert Greve down here in the corner here, and a sketch by Walter Mantell of Susted's start station in 1848. Now there's a few lines just here, just beneath Robert Greve's photograph, and it says about how he was the first person to bring sheep over the Kakanui River in the 1850s, and he also slept in the cave under the Totra tree for three months. <laughs> three months? It must have been some cave. <laughs> it took me some time and more reading to figure out that what should, what should have been obvious. He wasn't the first person to stay in that cave, was he? Once I started looking back to what was, what and who had happened in the story, the story broadens out and yet I could so easily have started the story there without finding out who else had come that way. Tupperware is a concept that we deal with a little bit at Heritage New Zealand and it, it means the sacred footprint. So we're encouraged much more now to talk about and find out about all those people that have gone on before. Um, I have to say at that point that the concept of Tupperware is much more to the fore with Heritage New Zealand now. We are about to embark on some new interpretation plan for the estate 
I'm glad to say that it will include more about the rest of the people who traversed and lived in this land long before the sheep came. So from here, the story of the limestone cave under a tree on what became the famous Tokra estate, we can tell so many stories, not just of Waitaki, but microcosms of the history that makes up Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm going to use this geographic feature as a starting point and take you with me on the same journey of discovery that I went on when I, when I discovered that there was more people that used that cave than just Robert Greve. I'm certainly not an expert on this, but hopefully I can point some of you in the direction to look further for yourself. So what was the deal with the land? Just the Jones. And prior to the 1840 treaty, there had, been, there had been a massive land grab going on for the potentially rich lands of the so-called Middle Island. Various men lay, started laying claim to literally millions of acres of land until various combinations of capitalists and fortune seekers had between them laid claim to the whole of the South Island in many places three or four times over. The last and the biggest of these claims came just after the signing of the treaty and was claimed by none other than our own local man, Johnny Jones, as part of a syndicate with a New South Wales politician named W.C. Wentworth. In this case, they paid a few hundred pounds and also bought the whole of the South Island, mm -hmm. which they called, and I'm going to put this up so you can see it all, how audacious this claim was. Tāwai Ponamu, or Kai Kōbi, also called the Middle Island of New Zealand and also the island called Stewart's Island and all in singular the islands, islets, rocks and reefs there to adjacent or appertaining together with all seas, harbours, coasts, bays, inlets, rivers, lakes, waters, mines, minerals, fisheries, woods, forests, liberties, franchises, profits, emoluments, whatever they are, advantages, hereditaments, rights, members and etc etc so it pretty much covers everything. <coughs> Needless to say, confusion, anger, litigation and frustrated greed followed. The new colonial government suspended all dealing in land at, in, in, 19, in 1840 and sent agents down to the South Island to decide the validity of such extravagant claims. Most estates were disallowed or cut down. The grand claim of Johnny Jones was pretty much ignored. Whatever, the first great South Island land boom was, in the words of Stephen Eldred Greve, a fizzer. Right. This is not you, Mike, although it could well be. <laughs> short, short. <laughs> Very gorgeous. <laughs> Just gorgeous. <laughs> this is Edward Shortland. So back now to our little part of the world around Otorara. Um, so we'll take a look through the eyes of a traveller at the time who wrote down his observations. 1844 was a busy year for the land surrounding this area, with many interesting travellers passing through. And one of these sent to look at the pre-treaty land claims was one Edward Shortland. His title was Sub-Protector of Aborigines under the New Zealand government. And in that capacity and as an interpreter, he went to Otago in 1843 with a commissioner who was investigating pre-treaty claims. When his official duties were over, he took the opportunity to see more of the country. So he hitched a ride in a whale boat heading north. He made a brief stop at Shag Point to check out the coal deposits there, a bit sulphurous apparently, and on the 3rd of November he arrives at Moiraki. He stays with the waiter Hughes and his family in his comfortable weatherboard house and makes a lot of inquiries about who and what, etc. He's a very curious chap and unfortunately he wrote a lot of this down. The next night he shifts his tent to the Maori village at the Kaik where he notices an excellent crop of potatoes and no doubt continues to ask lots of questions. He looks around, heading back down to Wakawiti, and I'm sure he went through Palmerston and Pukitapu as well, and then eventually decides to go overland from there to Akaroma. So on the 5th of January, he's back in Moiraki, and he sets off northwards a few days later. My source for this notes that he's traveling with three Maori, Maoris, from my source. It's hard reading that now, as you just wonder who were they and what were their names. He does enlist the help of another Maori named Pukurako as a guide to help them to get to the Waitaki River. His route takes him along the beach, and it's quite good to imagine if you know Hampton Beach, past the side of where Hampton is now, and as far as the Headland Bluff. On the northern side of the bluff, he notes a small boat harbour and a great potato patch. He then walks inland about half a mile to cross the Wainakarua River, and then up the coast to the Kakanui. He also goes upstream here to cross the Kakanui, opposite a white cliff on the northern bank, 
where he camps for the night. He's now on the land and eventually becomes Tota Estate. And although he does not record stopping near the cave, we can add his footprints to the others who followed the trails this way over the years. They continue on and come to Cape Wanbrow, where he records how they looked north over the extensive plains, the future site of Omaru. They explore there a bit, and apparently while his companions are busy eating berries on the banks of the creek, Shortland amuses himself by shooting two ducks and two gulls, a possible solution to the gull problem in downtown Omaru. <laughs> <laughs> they finally make their way to Tipuna Omaru, a village where he sought assistance in crossing the river. I know I'm getting a little out of the Ōtōtara area, but there are a couple of things I'd like to point out. By starting our stories with when the Europeans arrived, we're not really telling our stories. When Richard Greaves spends three months in the cave, if he found it useful, then it's highly likely that many others over the years have also passed that way and stopped there. There were trails all across the land. The men I'm talking about now, crossing this area, were accompanied by guides who were showing showing them the way because they knew the way. The other point I notice as I'm reading Shortland's account and others is how gracious the Takata Whenua are. Shortland meets Chief Huruhuru at the village where, who he describes as a man of singularity, pleasing manners and address, qualities I was more surprised to meet with in this wild and desert looking place. Not only that, but Huruhuru gives Shortland a description of the Waitaki Valley and drew with a pencil a very accurate and detailed map of the Great Lakes of the Kluta Basin. It was probably detailed because he'd been there and knew them well. Shortland is intrigued by the way the people cut Raupo and fashioned Mōhuki. One was large enough to transport Shortland, two of his companions, the chief and his wife, plus their baggage. So Huruhuru makes Shortland a pair of flax sandals, which he tries out by walking a couple of miles towards the Waitaki River mouth, where he makes a sketch map of, the, of that river mouth. Shortland now heads north, but a funny thing happens. As he's making camp, he was amazed to see a solitary Euro European coming from the north. That's George, Bishop George Selwyn. I told you it was a busy year. More, uh, so, yeah. Enter the next interesting chap to pass through in the year 1844. This energetic, striding chap is actually George Selwyn, Bishop of New Zealand completing a pastoral tour of the country. He also has quite a considerable entourage of Maori companions with him, but Selwyn was often ahead, always anxious to be on the move and getting to, to wherever he was going. The two parties set up camp together and no doubt have a lot to catch up on. So now we're going to follow Bishop Selwyn back as he's headed south, back crossing the land that became Totara State as he makes his way to Moraki and beyond. Huru Huru, Selwyn also describes as singularly pleasing, accompanies the party across the river. They land probably around where the bridge is now and Selwyn keeps his pace up across the plains, over the Cape, through the Totara landscape and stops for the night at Day Bay. The next day he makes it to Moiraki where he goes about his pastoral work preaching and baptising. It is here that Selwyn notes that this place has been visited by the French bishop but no one else except Mr Watkin, the Wesleyan missionary, so that bishops were more common than ministers. <laughs> more bishops than you could poke a stick at. So to recap, we've had the Swedish Sussted, the Scottish Shepherd Greve, Shortland and his party, and then Bishop Selwyn all pass through the vicinity of the Totra tree. And also to fill my quote, quota of bishops, Pompalia visited Moiraki late in 1940. The records go quiet for a few years, and then we get to 1848. And this character comes into the scene. 1848 was a key year as the land passed from Maori ownership, which had been recognised by the whole for the whole South Island by the Treaty of Waitangi to the Crown. On the 12th of June at Akaroa, a government agent by the name of Henry Tacey Kemp negotiated the purchase of a large part of the South Island, extending from Kaipoi to Otago, for a cash payment of $2,000, the promise of land set aside for the people vague references to schools and hospitals. As Casey McDonald puts it in his book, White Stone Country, the trifling payment, the neglect of whatever promises had been made, the vagueness of the description of the boundaries, and the cheese carrying nature of the delimitation of the reserves made it a thoroughly unsatisfactory transaction and created a long-standing grievance. I think there's a lot of pain and sadness tied up in those words. 
So there's a lot of pressure on the Kaitahu to sell to the New Zealand Company, including threats of military action. It was an unequal negotiation and the expectations on the part of Kaitahu of equal partnership continued, continued access to their traditional lands, hospitals and schools just did not evaluate. As the story of New Zealand moved from the runs in the 1850s to the estates in the 1860s and then the farms in the 1890s and onwards, the increasing number of settlers arriving overwhelmed the original promises made to the people who had occupied it for centuries before. It, it does make gruelling reading. Another one of the 1848 travellers who arrived at Moiraki with a view to finding a site for, the, for New Edinburgh, Frederick Tuckett, says, The district, of the district of country possesses also a great advantage in this, that there are almost no natives. On the great plain in the south of the peninsula, there are not, as we are told, more than 30 or 40 altogether, so that settlers in this part of the country have nothing to fear from claims to land or annoying attempts at extortion. <laughs> you can start seeing the clash of cultures occurring. The English version of the Kent Purchase read, our places of residence and our cultivations are to be reserved for us and our children after us, and it shall be for the governor here to, hereafter to set apart some portion for us where the land is surveyed by the surveyors. In the Maori version, the word for cultivation was mahika kai, which by no means means the same thing. Mahika kai was the term used to describe any food resource locality not the small gardening plots envisaged by the use of the English word cultivations. Mm -hmm. The climate of the South never allowed Kaitahu to be a nation of settled gardeners, and for hundreds of years they had led a semi-nomadic life, pursuing a seasonal round of hunting and gathering over their huge territories. According to the time of the year, the hapu would be found tending their gardens inland, gathering fern root, fishing on the coast or in the rivers, chasing weaker in the snow of the foothills, in winter or harvesting molting ducks among the lake margins. For a people whose kai was gathered from the southern Alps to the sea and its islands, their impending confinement to reserves, consisting of fixed farming plots, spelled the end of a way of life. In contrast, the view of one pr British pr prospective settler was that there was, that there was no way a few Maori could farm millions of acres, so there was a moral duty to take the land for farming. The swindle that was the Kent Purchase was becoming harder to bear. Moving along now to this character, Walter Mantell. <coughs> so we already touched on him, that, that original board we had were a sketch by Walter Mantell as he came through in 1848. He was the officer appointed to mark out the reserves, said reserves um, mentioned in, um, in the Kent Purchase. He was said to have interpreted the spirit of his instructions as authorising him to keep the reserves as small as he could persuade them to accept. So we're going to follow Mantell for a while as he appears on the scene at Ototra as he's travelling the south to make out those reserves. He's travelling with a young surveyor by the name of Wills, several workmen and also the great Otago chief Tairoa. They crossed the Waitaki on 24th of October 1848 but found no one home at Tipuna or Manu. We had hoped to find Huruhuru. So he carries on down the Wairika Creek and onto the Kakanui, onto Kakanui where he camps. He now finds that Huruhuru is ill at Waka Waiiti. So they all go to and stay at Susted's outstation at Otipopo. They hang around for a while, the weather is bad, and Mantel occupies himself by walking around the run and taking pictures. I mean sketches. <laughs> then on the 3rd of November, Rawiri Ti Mamaru Horomona, Pohio and others arrived to represent Huruhuru who is apparently still not well enough to travel. The whole party, Maori and Pakeha, set off back to the Waitaki, camping for the night in pouring rain in caves under the famous Totara tree. <laughs> <coughs> so now we have quite a party staying in those caves and some are very great mana. I've got a friend in Christchurch, Sheree, who's also um, Mahis de Kaitahu and Horomona Pohio is her ancestor. She also lent me this book, Te Mai Haroa in the Promised Land by Buddy Makari, which has really opened up my eyes um, to a lot of these stories that I'm telling you today. A lot of the books I was reading, particularly the older books, glossed over the details of local Maori, 
but this one is filled up with a lot of a lot of knowledge we met we before so many had been anonymous but now they were given names and their stories filled out so now i'm added to my story Horamona Pohiro. oh i'm sorry i've missed out for a world to men tell there's one of his sketches and there's a little bit of him um, there's, there's him riding a mower <laughs> of course he um, discovered the moa bones at Awamoa Creek and has quite a bit to do in um, doing the story in this area. So I'll just move on now to Horamona Pohiro. So here he is now, um, staying in the cave under the Tota tree as he accompanies the man who is trying to reduce any chance of the fair and promised access to their traditional food gathering lands. The absolute inadequacy of these so-called reserves became problematic straight away. In 1849, Matiaha Tiramorehu petitions Governor Eyre asking for more land. Who does the Governor go to to seek advice on this? The fox guard in the hen house, Walter Mantell. He asks him, is there enough land in the reserves you are granting? Of course there is, says Mantell, so the petition is denied. Another example of the difficulties being faced now as a reward for helping with the surveying of land, a family living in the Hakataramia area, Mantel set aside a reserve for six, of 60 acres in 1852. Unsurprisingly, it took 10 years for that to be ratified. A few years later, lo and behold, all the good portions of the reserve had been sold by the provincial government as freehold land, or were under preemptive right of purchase to local settlers. The paper reserve made by Mantel for all intents and purposes no longer existed. The new owners even banned Maori from hunting weka on their pastures. Horamona Pohio embarks on a long period of seeking justice for his people. As well, it's beyond this talk tonight for me to go into his story and it's not my story to tell. But he, like the others of Great Mana in the cave that night, learned quickly about the war of words that it took to get anything to the attention of parliament or get something done about the agreements. I'm leaving out so much, much. The incredible story of Tim Maharoa's journey and occupation of a site in Omarama is a statement of withdrawal from the deceitful and unjust European society that was being formed. That takes place at this point. The profit movement, the king movement, Tafiti and the Taranaki land wars. But all these stories can be referenced in both our local space here in the geopark of Waitaki and have national significance as the stories of Aotearoa. Just like to finish up with oh, oh there's this um, map drawn by Tyroa, and it, it's just very interesting that they spend a lot of time drawing maps for the for these European people that are just mm. using them um, to disadvantage them. But the generosity is amazing. So we had David Higgins come and speak recently at Tota Estate, um, and talking about this come Kahuru Maru project, which is. Kaitahu Cultural Mapping Project. And um, interestingly enough, just what I've been talking about is carries on. So in the recent land tenure reviews going on, <coughs> Kaitahu still had to prove that their people had been across the land. And they did so by collecting up all the names of the places and the stories and putting them together in this project, which has been just amazing. So I've gone from the landscape of the geopark, the limestone caves and the bare landscape where a single tree can give an area its name, to the people who passed this way through here, the European ones who had such an impact on our later story, and to the Maori who were here for so many centuries before and imprinted their stories on the land and their stories and their songs. So we get a glimpse of those who had walked this way for so many centuries before and their stories are still ongoing. You only have to listen to Parliament to know that. So I hope my little story tonight, which has been really just a brief summary of events over these years, will encourage you all to look a little further yourselves into the social story of the area encompassed by the geopark. And it's been surprising that the key stories of the human occupation of not just this region, but the whole of New Zealand, can be told by looking at some of those who pass through the trails at Skirted or Tōtara, the place of the Tōtara. Mm -hmm. Thank you.